Hi, my name is Benedict. Uh, this is actually going to be part three, and I was going to do four parts to this series on tone and looking at the, the you know, the much bigger rules of music, rather than looking at uh, key and scale or this, you know, these little tiny rules about this is how you side chain or whatever. That, that I see far too much in forums, and people get distracted by them and miss the real point. But I was going to do this one on, on EQ. And then I was asking for a track to be able to mix purely with EQ, so no faders, just EQ, just to show you how powerful tone really is. But I'll be real honest and say uh, interest in this series has been close to zero. So I'm not going to abandon it. I don't like to abandon things I've started. I still believe this is super, super important information and very liberating for people who get their head around it but I also don't want to feel like I'm flogging a dead horse. So I'll finish it. I'll finish it as well as I can, but they'll just be the one. If you had been thinking to offer me a track to mix, by all means present it, but it's not going to not gonna fit into this series anymore. As to what the next series will be, I have no plans or ideas at the moment. If there is something you do want to hear on my take, please tell me down below. Subscribe. Give me positive feedback. This is what helps me to keep going. All right, so tone. What we've looked at is the idea that, as I said, there are actually rules far bigger and far more important than the ones we tend to focus on, or at least everybody in folk forums tends to focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. You worry about, oh, well, if I play this chord, what chord am I allowed to play next? Any bloody chord you want that works. Absolutely any chord. So you could play this, and, and that could be perfectly legitimate. Now, I'm not trying to be sort of hipstery and like, oh, whatever you feel is right, man, and eat some avocado, and any of that kind of crap. It's got to be relative. So I'm always saying that everything is relative to what's around it. I'm not saying that good and bad is relative to what's around it, but what's the purpose of this? If we were to start our piece, nice, comfortable, great. And then something bad's happening, great. It goes back to being nice. All legitimate choices. There's far too much of the idea of there's only so many choices I'm allowed to make because Adolf Hitler said I can't do this and that, and then people throw them away. The trouble is you throw out the baby with the bathwater. So the real rules here are those of achieving the goal. You want to express something? I just told the story there and gave you music to back it. My music backed it. You may not have liked it personally, but if you look at the story and what I played, just rewind yourself a little bit there. <laughs> what I played and my story matched very well. Therefore, fit for purpose. So we looked at the whole concept that there is a range from total silence to all the noise in the universe all at once. Both extremes quite uncomfortable. In music, it's about balancing those two, so not much happening. Got busy, and then went back to not much happening. It's that contrast. If we were to play a whole piece that was... Apart from calling it house music, it's not very exciting. It's the contrast of... ...that makes things happen. So everything's working on a continuum, but not just in a 2D scale, but in a th totally 3D thing. I've done this a few times to really try and get across to people that often when you're looking at little minor rules, know when you, that you shouldn't use consecutive fits. Why the hell not? There have been lots of good pieces of music that have used consecutive fits. I think that's how it goes. And they're great pieces of music. There are plenty of bad pieces of music that have done nothing but this. But then there are some good pieces of music that have done that too. 
So that tells us that when musicologists come after the fact, or that people writing two minute tutorials on how to do some little technical thing on their EDM stuff, that they're applying rules after the fact and saying you can or you can't or you do or you don't, rather than saying, what's the purpose here? Defer always to the big rules. I'm saying, largely forget the little rules for the moment. Defer to these big rules. The big rules are the ones of that you've got from silence to all noise. You've got from quiet to incredibly busy. You've got from dull to bright, thin to thick, all of these. If we looked at filters. Here is a filter. <laughs> Filters largely are designed to remove. So whatever is above or below the cutoff point, they will get rid of. So they allow you to shape a sound, and if you apply an envelope to them, you can shape an, a sound over time. Very, very basics of, of synthesis, but tone over time is one of the really important big rules even though it seems so simplistic that you go, yeah, but why am I thinking about it? The fact that you don't think about it and then think about can't use consecutive fifths or I've played a D minor seventh, therefore I have to play an, an A major cuth or something or other. It's like, piss off, you know, play what sounds right for your story, not someone else's. So we've got filters, which we've looked at. They're basically designed to cut things off. The next thing to look at is EQ. So we've got our sound here. If we switch in an EQ, here's one I prepared earlier. We've now got a very different instrument. We've got that which is probably a little unrefined. It's not unique, that's for sure. If we apply it, an EQ curve to it. At the moment, I'm deliberately not showing you this. We've now gotten a unique instrument. Now you'll notice I haven't changed anything here but our EQ curve. Let's look at the word equalize. It carries certain connotations which I see echo in tutorials and, and people's chatter all the time, and I think they're very negative connotations. To equalize, to make the same. I understand that EQs did serve that purpose. It's like, oh, I haven't got enough bass, I better put some bass in this so that it sounds the same as it should. Fine. But as soon as you start really going beyond that and applying that to your first line of thinking, it says there's something wrong. The underlying thinking is broken because it says the instruments I've got are wrong. Okay, if they really are the wrong instruments, like if I'm singing my happy love song over that musical backing, I would say that's probably wrong because it doesn't match. So if your instruments are wrong, you shouldn't have them there in the first place. Change your instruments, change the nature of your piece. Oh, there's a music coming, I'm going to kill you. Okay, cool, it matches. Not elegant, but it matches. So if something is in your perception wrong, then you need to do it differently. Either by changing that instrument, you've got someone playing reggae guitar in the middle of your heavy metal song, it may not fit very well. Or you can say, look, we are a metal band, but you know what? We've got a corker of a reggae track here. Let's shift direction a little bit. Because we've got a corker of a track and, you know, we've, we've really got something winning that people will want to hear. Either is legitimate, but you've taken away the concept of wrong, needs to be equalised, needs to be fixed, needs to be made the same. Same is a bad idea. Same are those rules you're concerned about. Same are the rules that should be thrown away. Big picture. What are we trying to say? We've got our reggae song, but we're a heavy metal band. 
change something. Don't say it's wrong, because as soon as you say it's wrong, you've got problems. Now, in EQing, you often have people talking about, oh, there are bad frequencies. And this is the fallout of this. There are no bad frequencies. Absolutely none. Not a single one of them is bad. So why go saying they're bad? You may not want them there. Okay. So my question is, why did you put them there in the first place? Again, if you're a metal band and, and you've hired the world's greatest reggae guitarist, what are you thinking? You're either thinking it's time to change direction as a band, or you need to smack whoever does your hiring upside the head. Or that reggae guitarist is actually deciding to have a life change, in which case you've just hired an experienced guitarist from another genre to play in your metal band. There's no wrongs here, but only if you don't plan what you're doing, if you jam things that don't belong there for no purpose. So frequencies, no such thing as bad frequencies. If you're working with a drum kit, you may have rattles. I was listening to a thing with a drum kit the other day on YouTube, and there was a lot of squeak coming out of the kick drum pedal. Number one would be fix it. Don't put it to tape. If you're putting it to tape with a squeak in it, it's either part of the performance, you're saying, yep, I'm recording this rough as guts punk band and you're, they never oil their, their kick pedals. Fine, it's part of the thing. You know, just like in some punk songs, they belch and swear and what have you. It's part of the thing. So if you've got something that shouldn't be there, don't put it down on tape in the first place. Absolutely don't. Some things is hard to avoid. If you were a mix engineer and you got sent this drum track with the squeaky kick pedal, then you might look at it saying, okay, I need to find that and get rid of it. But you know what? It's the last thing you want to do. Because here, here, I'm, let's say I decide that I don't like these frequencies here, they're sticking up. How dare they stick up? I mean, that's the character of the sound, but nonetheless, it's offending me that they stand outside of the, the visualization. Who oh, no. So, we're going to cut them out. But listen to what happens to the sound. It's no longer what we had, which is a really warm, fat, 70s kind of sound. a thin gutted sound. So every time you fix something, you do damage. And this is a thing to really, really take into account. Every time you fix something, you do damage. So is the damage you're about to do less than the problem you're about to solve? Often you're better off saying this isn't a problem and embracing it and making something of it. Halfway through your punk song, the singer goes, Bleh! use it. They're a fucking punk band. What are they doing not belching and throwing up in the middle of their songs? <laughs> See? Re-approach what's right wrong to context. So saying that there are certain frequencies that are bad, be very, very careful with. Sometimes you have problems and something's misbehaving by all means. But then you probably needing a dynamic EQ, which is where you have a compressor circuit that says, oh, when that gets a bit loud, I'll just pull it back a bit. And hear how we're not really changing the overall tone of that sound anywhere near as much as when we just go. So we're still allowing that to be dominant, obviously you can hear it because I'm pumping it, but you're better off using a dynamic EQ, which is essentially a compressor tied to an EQ point. If you want to try one without committing dollars to it, then the Tokyo, Tokyo Dawn, um, Tokyo Dawn, uh, so effects, down the bottom here. TDR Nova. So Tokyo Dawn Labs, then Nova. 
it's you can use it just as an EQ. You can use it just as a compressor, but it's probably not the world's greatest compressor. But it's designed to take particular points and then whoop, 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 as those frequencies get too loud. That's when you get problem solving with EQ. But for the moment, let's put the whole idea of EQs are there to solve problems out of your mind. As a producer, you're there to solve potential problems, but that's not your main role. That's your third or fourth role. Your main role is to understand the song, the story of the song, and get that out there. That's the number one rule. So let's look at our EQ curve that we applied. We start with this, a little chantless. You can put that in the middle of a mix, um, along with uh, you know the right kind of chorusing or an ensemble effect, as in a Selena string ensemble effect. It's going to sound brilliant. You probably have to reduce the volume overall because you don't normally hear those so loud, but it works. So what we've done, last video I talked about, along with filters, I talked about things like amp cabinets for your guitar. Krang! You put it through your guitar cab, unjack it, put it in another one, go krang, and it sounds different because your combination of amp and, um, and speaker and microphone and what have you, it's just a different tone that's overlaid on it. All we've done here is we've said that across the board, everything that comes out of this synth will have this platform attached to it. It'll be changed in this way. Make it brighter. We we'll cut those bits out to make it sound a bit gutted. Add some of those, so it gives you that, that sort of kind of nice seventies resonance. And then some bottom. Lines. This is what, in the modern world, you primarily use EQ to do. Now, be careful. As I've warned you before, do not do this too much in solo. This sounds great, so getting that in the mix where we've got a lot happening in this arena, we could be in trouble. But this is just to show you, don't look at EQ in the way that a lot of people tell you and say it's about fixing bad things. The other one you'll hear is only ever cut. That's part of the same thing. Only ever cut. Okay. So that's like going to your score and saying only ever take off notes. That's dandy if you've started with Mozart because he put too bloody many notes in there in the first place. I assume you watched the movie. If you didn't, you bloody well should. Not because it's a good movie, it's more shit, but you should know something about the old Mozart. Add what you need to add to achieve your results. And the reality is Mozart added way too many notes because he was a florid fellow. Go for it. People like him. So nearly understand that there are some parts in this signal I might want to subtract. Some that I might want to add. If, I'm, if I want to pay for your sound, I'd add. So there's not a sense of me going, oh no, okay, well, we'll only subtract. Because that sound is not this sound. So no rules, add and subtract as much or as little as you need. Generally try to go with subtle. This is deliberately unsubtle. I'm not using any other tools. My whole tool to create this unique sound is just the EQ, so it can be as unsubtle as I, as I need. But within a mix, we're probably going to want to be a little bit more subtle, especially if you're using other tools. But go as hard as you want. You can even layer up multiple EQs. You might decide in the end that that's just a little too toppy, in which case we can roll a little off. We might decide it's a little bassy because we've got other stuff happening in there. Hear how it's still essentially the same sound that we gave before. 
that's subtle, but you can notice the difference here. So a combination of where you're being creative, have at it. Add and subtract huge amounts of stuff. But once you get above about 18 dB of particularly um, boost, then you can start to find problems with itself oscillating. There can be situations in which that's useful, got a kick drum, and rather than and you don't want to add in a fake sine wave underneath it. You know, if you're working with a real kick drum, a real kick drum, and you don't want to add a fake sine wave underneath it, quite simply get a very pointy EQ like this, find your frequency, down there somewhere, turn it up. So what that's done is actually created a kind of resonance. So you find the right point on just that kick drum, give it a great big boost. If necessary, give it a couple of things which are boosting. And here we've got two boosts because we've got a broad boost and a little peak here. And you'll suddenly find that it gives you that that you get as though you added a sine wave. Obviously go cautiously with it, you don't want it to sound overdone, but it's far better than using sub-synthesizers, because all that's doing is adding something that's not real. At least here, if you're working with a real band with real kick drums, you've actually used the real frequencies that are there, rather than adding one that was never there. So that's like uh, a woman sticking things on her front and thinking that it makes her better looking. Okay, she might get more notice because it's like, whoa, but she doesn't become more beautiful as a result of that. Making the most of what you do have naturally is the way to go. So that covers basically what we need to know about EQ. There are all kinds of shapes. You can get into very broad. Let's just turn this off. You can get into very broad cuts and boosts. This gets us as narrow as to be able to pick out basically one, one frequency, one overtone. Um, use those if necessary on a boost, as I said, for things like you know, adding a, a, to a kick drum if, it's, if, you, if you feel you absolutely need it, if the piece needs it, not just because you say, well, kick drums should sound like that. Books. We had decades where they didn't sound like that. Again, equally, and this is for if we really do have an issue, some synths will tend to output, particularly FM more or something that's using a noisy way of creating sounds, can sometimes just have a really noticeable peak somewhere, in which case you can find it and slay it with that. But again, always look at what's my trade off. I may have fixed one problem, but what damage have I done? Because you've always done damage. The moment you think I'm not doing damage, you, you're lost. And then you can go to really broad cuts and boosts. And as you hear, they can be fairly subtle. And we're really just changing the overall tone. That's something that you'll do within instruments and mixing and very much if you get into the mastering thing, then everything's very subtle. One or two dB is often plenty when you're doing that. Let's kill this fella off. No, we won't save that. Now we're going to look at a piece. Now, I'll run through this. This is not the world's best piece of music. It's not meant to be. And nor is it mixed. I've made some very basic decisions, common things, tracking type decisions after that. The band has just played this for me.
Okay, that's enough to be going on. So it, quite typically for a band, everyone's just decided to have it relatively held the leather and then chose drum patterns, which were sort of like that as well. Tiny bit of processing on the drum. All I have done is added the tape effect, which has a little bit of a little bit of overdrive and the built-in compression. I've deliberately not made the drum kit too dull because that's something we'll look at is tone here. I'm going to solve its tone problems there. I'm going to solve its tone problems in terms of the mix. Find the opportunities of where that sounds good in the mix. Bass is really simple. Simple bass is just that. Listening here, I may have a little too much. I put everything in a room. There may be a bit too much of that, so let's go here. And again, I'm only using EQ. So remember, I'm going to do this whole mix with EQ and nothing but EQ. No changing levels, because they're all adequate for the task, even though the piece is very cluttered. So we can roll off a bit here. Okay, less clutter. So I'm happy with that for now. My high quality guitarist. BX7. The guy with the string synth has been pretty darn heavy handed, I can tell you. Trumpet. Real character sound, there's quite a bit of noise in that uh, in that beginning, but it gives it character. So but we're gonna we're gonna work our way around that. And then it's just our trumpet line again, only it's transferred off onto a very delicate digital synth. It's not about whether you would think my piece of music is good or not. It's actually not good. It has no purpose other than to be illustrated upon here. So the first decision we've got to make here is What's important here? What's the story that we've got here? Well, seeing we've got a melodic line, that's our story. Tempting, I know most of you are going to say, oh, well, there's our story. You know what? It's not. It's very generic. Even when it gets a wee bit thrashy on the drums, it's still pretty generic. That doesn't mean there isn't mileage in this. If I thought it was useless material, I would have you know, put it here. But it's generic. Same with the strumming guitar. It's just supporting. These brass, they're just supporting. They're just punctuation. That's all they are. Doesn't matter what notes they're playing, whether they're clever or not, it's just punctuation. Strings, well, as I said, they're heavy handed, but they're just a mix filler. Heavy handed mix fillers, but that's all they are. And then this guy here is an echo of this. So, really, our most important part is this. Our trumpet line. So let's have a look at it. So the next question is again, where and how is he important? What's his role here? So we can see most of his action is up here. His fundamentals here, and a lot of the wifu actions up here. But we've got a lot of happening down here. If we were to listen to only that, I 
Okay, it might qualify as a kick drum, but that's absolutely not its role at all. We've already got a kick drum. So what we know here is that we've got a lot of stuff that we have no use for. Therefore, let's roll it off. What's the lowest note we play here? This G. Looking at our fundamental, that's it, we're fine. Everything below that's actually noise. Not particularly useful noise. Now we've got one or two ways of going about this, and we've got to make a decision. Remember, everything's about decisions. I can hack it off completely. But notice that this actually has some body with it. So we've then got to say, well, how does this go with regards to our mix? We could look at merely reducing the volume. Let's take that off the bell. But I know there's a fair bit happening in the bass area because of our kick and our bass. So while there is some interesting material down there that's just, just a little bit of extra body, I don't believe that it's going to serve any purpose. So seeing I don't believe it's going to serve any purpose, I'll make it go on. We, could, we looked at the options of just reducing the volume of it, but it didn't sonically seem that much different. Fair enough, this doesn't have a sub on it, but nonetheless, I don't think that it was going to provide anything of any value in the mix, in which case, I'll get it gone, because I'm going to want to work in this area with something else. So this is one of the great things about EQ, and I've been trying to hammer it home all the way along here. Your decisions are always relative, relative to what the story is, relative to what's happening around it. If this was solo, I might even boost that pace there, give it a real intimacy and a, and a fatness and a bigness. But it's not solo. It, I've got a mix to contend with, and it's not going to cut. It's just going to muddy up. So bye-bye. Off you go. That's all I'm going to do with that for the moment. Now the rest, the next ones are strings. These are... Um, Challenging. Tempting when soloed to have that bass, but remember we've got a bass line. So it's nice that our keyboard has decided to be very grand and play all over the place at once. But I don't think he's really thought ahead as to what his actual role is. Therefore, we'll get rid of a fair amount of that bass. When you play a bass note, you see it's still got a whole pile of overtones. So that sub down there serves no real purpose. Our lowest note is C1, which I'm playing there, so that's about right. I think this is too dominant across across the board. So we then got to decide, well, up here, and these aren't mixed decisions I'm making at the moment, I'm merely looking at the instrument going, well, this is what its role is, where is it fitting, what do I do? It's nice to have those highs, for the moment at least, but if I've got too many of them, they mask, as in compared to everything else in the track. They just basically steal their thunder. And remember, our track's about our lead line, our melody. That's what's telling our story. That's the unique part of this piece. So these strings are not unique, but they serve a purpose. So let's back them right off. So...
Okay. We may have some issues there. I think we're going to hack a little harder at that later. But for the moment, it's put it in probably a workable place. Our brass, which is this fella here. <laughs> Fairly well behaved as a sound. One of the problems is it doesn't really have a character. It needs character. So before I even do much, I'm going to have a, a stab at finding its character. So E. And A. Now, common thing that you'll get told is to to find the bad frequencies. I don't believe that's the best strategy. I'm not the only guy who doesn't believe that's the best strategy. After a little while, you should be knowing, as a musician, as a, as a mix engineer, whatever, you should be knowing roughly what sounds like what where. So you should know that that sounds bright and tizzy. That sounds thick and full. Therefore, if you're hearing something that you want more of, or less of, you should be able to approximate what you are. So you'll see I tend to move play, move play, move play, not trying to pretend to be a phase shifter. Just, I kind of like that. I know for many of you, you'll go, oh, Benedict, that's the honky part of it. That's the bit that sounds like tin cans. Exactly, it's a brass sound. It is tin cans being farted in. So we want to bring that out because that's the character part of a sound. Once you put it in a mix, you want to pull through the unique characteristics of each instrument, rather than saying, oh, that's the honky bit, so we'll do this. You might like the tone of that better on its own, but you know what, it sounds like shite because it's got no character. So that's... That's just me guessing. Guitars. Now again, I know there's a lot, a lot happening here that we just don't want. Could go and pull it off. With acoustic guitars are strange things, you're often better off doing something like this. Not doing any more than that for the moment, it's just I know that in the mix that's just going to be too full of body. Because it's so busy I would have almost rather had a Nashville string but this is what I've got, that's what the guy played. That's cool, but I know that we don't want that much body in it, because otherwise it just sounds like this big cardboard box. Don't want that. Bass. And we're gonna need to look at what's happening with our as well. Sadly, both kick and bass are in exactly the same spot. You see that their peaks are in exactly the same place. So we need to decide which is which. Is it the kick drum or is it the bass drum? Bass guitar. The bass, I'm going with the bass. So I will be wanting to find 
its lowest note seems to be this. So I'll give it a little, little bit of reinforcement there. Then we switch across to our kick. Hear how that's it's not in the same spot. We're now slightly apart from each other. Hear how that's given our kick a kind of a thickness. Cool. This fella I'm not going to handle till later because by the time he's happening, he's sort of a, an echo of supporting instruments. So I want to know what the rest of my mix has done. And then I'm going to work him around that. So if we go back to our mix. Levels aren't a particular problem, so that's cool. I'm slightly worried, but not enough to worry too much. So let's look at now just taking our drum kit and our bass. Sitting nicely together. It might be a bit wet. I don't love. Space, 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 space. It needs more. It needs more body. Might have taken this a different way. I'm working to find the two together. Now, remember, I'm not using compression. All I've got is tone. I don't even have the ability to go up to that um, fader to adjust it. Faders are verboten. So if I've got to make changes, it's just here, and that's it. Thank you. 
Okay. Rhythm section come together. It's just tone. All I'm looking to do is to find how they complement each other. I'm not looking to say I need to get rid of any of these things because they're there in the first place and they're there for a reason. My drummer gets a bit thrashy. He's played it for a reason. I might have said, don't do that, mate, but it's there. And it's not a bad performance, so this is what we work with. We've got those sorted. Now, what we're doing here is looking to make the music bed. Remember, I went to the lead first. Now I'm just going to add in the extra parts. So if we see we've got the mixer up now, then we will mute our parts. What's next? Strings. Strings take up a lot of space next. It'd be tempting to put the guitars in, but then we're going to end up with a problem. What's dominant next is the strings. <laughs> Hopefully you've followed along with what I've done there. I'm looking to create a sound there that sits doing what the, the player intended this to do, which is to sit right there in the middle. So I've carved out, because I don't have the ability to use the volume control with the fader, I've carved out a sound purely from tone by getting rid of some of the lows entirely, fading everything back, and getting rid of a lot of that top end. There's a lot of buzz up there that on its own sounds kind of cool. But within the mix, all it does is create this, like, insects going off and annoying you. So I've pulled it to inside. So we've got our drums and bass, and then our string line inside. It almost makes it sound like an organ, but you know what? String machines sound like organs in the first place. So it's quite well within... And what it's playing has become quite clear, even though in a sense understated. And it wants to be understated because it's not a lead instrument. But that's that's a pretty good mix for the moment. What have we got next? The brass, no, but our acoustic guitar. That is part of the music bed for sure. So let's look what we got here. <laughs>
as expected, nothing but mud in the bottom end. Now, I don't know whether you noticed it, but in many ways, an acoustic guitar like this in a mix, I treat more like a hi-hat. It's not there providing chordal musical structure. It does, but in a subtle way. Just as if you had um, tuned hi-hats, you might say, oh, I mean, I'm playing C major now, so I'll play the, the C hi-hat, and, and now I'm play, playing D minor or whatever it would be, and you play your D hi-hat. You know, it's, uh, it's not that much difference. I know that's a radically different way from the way most people think about it, and a lot of guitarists will be like, oh, 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 oh. but it's like, get over yourself. You've played your role, and it's good. Well, say it's good anyway. It's good. It's sitting nicely in the mix. The job now is to get that through the mix without cluttering up the mix. I know you want to be the loudest part of the mix. But it's as, it's as I heard Glenn Fricker say with somebody's metal mix. It's like, oh, interesting. Got cool lead kick drum there. They had a singer. They had guitarists, but whoever had mixed it had mixed that kick drum so it speared through the mix. And it had effectively become the lead instrument in the mix over the singer, over the guitarists, over the bass player. So it had become the lead kick drum. You don't want to have lead acoustic guitars that are just drumming the chord. They're there for character, somewhat like high hats. <laughs> I'm just after that. You'll see me doing this. It's like that, you know, rub your fingernails over the other fingernails, and you've got that, not guero sound, but slightly like that. That's what I'm, I'm looking to pull out. That's what I'm hearing here in this guitar. So we've got our bed. I've also got them so that they're sitting very nicely with the metal work on the drums. So he's got his rides and cymbals and what have you, and they're sitting in very nicely alongside those. So as the, the drums metal work comes and goes, the acoustic guitar kind of comes and goes. So it's creating a sense of flow. Because if they're just there all the time, all they do is this, which is not very exciting. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't be played that way. But we've now got a sense of them flowing in and out of the piece, which is good. What have we got next? Our trumpet. Straight away, notice how that comes through nice and clear. In part because I've hacked off the bottom end that we don't need, but in also in great part because the music bed. Get rid of the term beat if you're thinking, oh, it's a beat, man. No, fuck off, it's not a beat. It's a music bed. That's the proper term. And when you understand it to be a music bed, this lies underneath what you're doing, like what's on top of. If you've got a wrapper, then your music bed might be what you're currently calling a beat. But your music bed is what sits underneath, and then you've got your feature. So, I just want to contour this sound, so for a couple of reasons. One is I've got a bit going on underneath it, so we don't want to focus this instrument where we've got stuff going on underneath it. So there's a fair amount happening in the mids, courtesy of our strings. Got quite a lot here. The 
Lucas has got quite a lot going on here as well, but the real character of the sand's a bit higher, where all the interesting happens. So we've given that a little bit of boost, and now it only needs a little bit of boost. If we do a lot of boost here, the digitally noisy nature of this sand comes out. Those noises are great. I programmed them in myself. But we don't want to overdo it. Brass is a noisy instrument, just totally ignoring valve noise or anything like that. You're, you're blowing into a bit of tin. It rattles like an empty tin can. And that's part of the great things about brass across the board. A saxophone, when played properly, is quite a dull instrument. When you let Clarence Clemens play it, well, maybe not today. It's an amazing instrument. It wails, it squeals, it, it's, it's an awesome instrument. This brass is designed to have some of that. You know, it's a little unruly, a little messy. So we're given a tiny boost here, cut some of where it's going to conflict. All we're doing is messing with the tone here, but we're just changing levels a little bit. A little bit of boost there to pull that through the mix. And you see I played a lot with up here. I want it to be bright. I want it to be really bright. But the nature of particularly this synth is it just keeps going all the way up there. There's no roll off on it at all. That's for me to, to deal with. But I want it to be bright, but I don't want it to sand up top. So I've given it the brightness, and then I've used a low pass filter to roll some of it off. You might think, but why would you give it brightness when you've rolled it off? Because I'm looking for nonlinear. So the, the instruments roll off like it's wave, rolls off nice and neat. What I'm doing is I'm saying, well, we'll do this. I've given it a curve, which means that different notes with different overtones are actually going to respond differently across that curve. Just as when you play different notes on a guitar through your Marshall stack, some of them actually end up becoming pointier than others because they hit the resonances of that, uh, that, that cabinet and, and the overdrive and everything. And some notes back off just a little because they kind of fall in the holes of where that speaker doesn't really reproduce much of anything very well anyway. The differences are very minor and a few dB across them, but it's enough that as you play across, some bits will stick out a little bit more. And that's what we're doing here. We're creating a non-linear top end, give it more character. <laughs> Levels are still okay. Now, for me talking there, it also allows me to clear my ears just a little bit. Because we've always got to come at this as though it's fresh, as though it's the first time we're hearing this and going, oh, you spend hours and hours inside your piece. You go, this is what you're supposed to sound like, rather than hearing it for what it is. When you go, this is what it's supposed to sound like, then you can end up going, oh, yes, I'm making a heavy metal piece. Listen, everyone, to my heavy metal piece. No one's hearing it but you. So give yourself that little bit of time. Now, we've got two other things to contend with here. We've got our keyboard player who got a little excited, gave us a, um, a brass thing. Not a bad idea because this piece basically repeats, so it's got to do something to keep our attention in the second half. So let's have a look at what we've got. <laughs> Okay, cool.
I realize I'm making a mistake. I forgot about our last sound. Now I'm trying to give this a lot of presence up high because we had the presence up high with our brass sound before with our trumpet. But the reality is we've got another very bright sound to come in. So what I might do is actually skip that for now. Let's mute him and let's move to our This is our melody. It's got those funny digitally noises that move around, but because it's got a more muted, well-behaved sound, other than those strange digital noises, because it's got a well-behaved sound, it's not spitting and hissing and farting like the, the, the original trumpet is, it, it's got a more laid-back feel. It's got some reverb on it already. The keyboard player had plenty of reverb on it, which you do with digital sounds to make them fill out, otherwise it's that. Mm. Um, it doesn't sound like a mosquito, but it sounds more laid-back, like a memory of something. Cool, I'm happy with that. Let's go back to our brass sound. Let's put everything back and see what we get. Okay, so as, as my thinking was right first time, I, I pulled myself off track there because I attacked this kind of the wrong way around. I followed the thinking I had been using, which was good to that point, which was let's get all the music bed sounds. But then I really had to deal with this sound, which is a bit unusual. It's different from the other sounds, as is this brass sound. So I focused on the focal sound, which is kind of weak and quiet. So I focused on pulling out what was important to put that in front of the mix, and I actually made the same decisions about the brass to put it in front of the mix. But the reality is, because I've got something else in front of the mix, it cannot be in front of the mix. It needs its role, and that is to sit in the middle there. Pretty extreme EQing going on here, but remember I don't have the ability to use the controls for the fader or the overall volume, therefore my only way is to attack the tone. Attack the tone possibly excessively, but it doesn't really matter. How you achieve your result is by the by. People say, oh, this is the technique you use. Bollocks. This is your story, this is your thing, and you get there however you need to. If you follow exactly the same technique as everybody else, how's your music any different? I know many of you are trying to not be different. But that's why you trap yourself into these funny little rules, which means you're then ignoring the real rules. So you break the real rules and then wonder why, oh, but, 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 but I followed that tutorial where it said turn the red knob to 48 and I should be having a pro hit. No, because you ignored the big rules doesn't matter how close to 48 you got with the red button, your piece is pointless. It's fucked because it's broken the rules. So we're focusing on keeping those rules, which is just by getting the tone to balance. 
which I believe we have done. Let's have a listen through now that I've distracted you and myself with my wee rant. works. See, we didn't have to get into compression, we didn't have to work well, a little tiny bit on the drum kit, um, we didn't have to get into anything. There's some echo on the, the main tr trumpet. Um, we put a, a um, an ensemble, as I said, a, a Selena string machine type ensemble on there, and there was some reverb and delay on this, as I said, otherwise <laughs> A set called very digital synth soprano just sounding like a mosquito. You've got to fill them out. But that's it. And we've now got a very nice workable mix. Again, you may be thinking, oh, but it doesn't sound like. Did I say this was Dead Mouse? No. It's a piece of music. We're telling a story and it's telling its story elegantly. If you want to tell your stories differently, have at it. But the thinking behind the way you have at it should be this way. Why I've shown you here. And then you're going to find suddenly you get your own style, your own feel, and your pieces, you start to feel better about them. There may be a lot of narrow minded people who only want to hear clones of Dead Mouse, but that's their problem. Ignore them. They are not fans. They're not fans of music. Go out and find people, people like me, who are looking to hear somebody do something that's really unique. So I can really go. I can hear that man's story in there. I can hear that woman's story in there. I hear that person's story in there. That's a record I want. That's a record I'll talk about. That's a record I'll remember and want to play again. Thank you very much. It's been an interesting series. I hope some people really do find value in this. If you do find value, please remember, subscribe, like, Comment positively. If there are questions, ask them. You have a good day now.